So first of all, thanks a lot for, for coming and listening to this talk. Uh, I am uh, representing Yandex. Yandex is a lar Russian tech company. It's a very large Russian tech company. It's like a Rus a Silicon Valley of Russia. It's Russian Google, Amazon, Uber. Oh, we, we hear that, guys. <laughs> it's like, so uh, Spotify and uh, everything else. So it's a very large uh, Russian company. I work at Yandex. and. Um, I am uh, the lead of the team uh, that is building uh, CatBoost library, and that's exactly the library that I want to talk to you about. Uh, so CatBoost is gradient boosting. We open sourced this library uh, last July, so it's more than half a year in open source already, and we have already more than 2,500 uh, 2, stars, which makes me really proud. We have thousands of uh, users uh, that are monthly downloading the library, uh, so what exactly this library is solving? It's gradient boosting. Uh, by the way, who of you knows XGBoost? Awesome. Who of you knows CatBoost? Wow, you, <laughs> there are people uh, here that, uh, that, is, that is really great. So, but most of you don't know, so you are my target auditories. Uh, this, this talk is, will, will be interesting for you. So uh, what, what is... Uh, uh, what is gradient boosting? Gradient boosting is a kind is type of machine learning algorithm that works well for heterogeneous data. There is homogeneous data like images, sound, text, or video, and for those kind of data, uh, usually neural networks are the best solution, state of the art. There is and there is also heterogeneous data. It's like, for example, when you are predicting credit scoring, you have different data. Uh, his uh, credit history of the person, his age, his gender, his salary, all, and all of that. And this doesn't have this much internal structure in the data. And for, the, for this type of data, gradient boosting usually gives the best solution. For that reason, in industry and also on Kaggle competitions uh, on this type of data, usually best solutions are based on gradient boosting. The next thing is that it's very, it is very easy to use. You do not have to be an expert, like with neural networks, to build a good uh, architecture. You, you just have your data set, you give it to the model, and it just works. And the next thing, it works well even if you have very small amount of data. For this set of reasons, it is heavily used uh, in many places. It can be used in finance, as I told, for example, to predict credit scoring. It can be used for recommendation systems to predict if the person will like the song or not, and in many other places. We use gradient boosting at Yandex heavily in many, many projects. So it's a production-ready production, production -ready solution. Uh, now about neural networks, as I told you, they work really well for homogeneous data, and it is a good idea to use uh, neural networks together with gradient boosting, and what we do, uh, or we calculate uh, neural features, for example, for a search of images, we calculate neural, neural features uh, based on the images, we combine those neural features with other knowledge about the objects that we have, and then on top of that we use gradient boosting model. And we do it in many places. So now how gradient boosting works, what you need to know, it is an iterative algorithm. Uh, it is usually based on decision trees. So you first build one decision tree, then after that you build another decision tree to make the error less, uh, to, to, to make the better model than the first one. Then you do it for hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands time, of times, and then you have a very complicated, uh, very, very uh, model that can find complicated things in your data. Uh, so that is the gradient boosting. Now about CatBoost. Here on this slide uh, is the main motivation why you, sh why you should try the library, and that is the comparison in terms of quality with other uh, gradient boosting libraries that are openly available. There, is, um, there are the libraries that is CatBoost, LightGBM, XGBoost, and H2O, and there is a set of publicly available data sets uh, that is from Kaggle competitions, KDD competition, and a well-known uh, data set adult and uh, the comparison in log loss. What you can see is that uh, CatBoost usually wins uh, in all the time wins. Uh, sometimes the difference is like very, very big. Well, like for data set Amazon, it's on almost 20% in quality increase. In other cases, uh, it might be different. The difference might be small, but it still wins. So it is the main, uh, the main reason to use uh, the library. All the benchmarks are uh, together with the code are on the GitHub so you can reproduce the results. This is the comparison after parameter tuning. So when you have selected best parameters for each model. Actually, and uh, it is also on GitHub, you can see the comparison with default parameters and CatBoost with default parameters. 
beats all other algorithms with tune parameters in the cases, in all cases except one, I don't remember which one, where LightGBM slightly outperforms, uh, LightGBM slightly outperforms uh, def default CatBoost. And that is because CatBoost is very stable to parameter changes, so it has very good quality from the start if you do, even if you do not tune the parameters. Now I will uh, deep in into the details of the library. First thing is uh, the kind of trees we are using. We are using uh, symmetric trees. All the libraries use different trees for boosting. LightGBM uh, builds trees in a greedy fashion, node by node. This way you can get a very deep node symmetric tree. XGBoost builds trees layer by layer and then prunes them. That means you get, cannot get very deep, uh, so you, but you have not deep uh, node symmetric tree. What we are doing, we are always using full binary trees that are symmetric. Here on the slide, you can see it's not. Uh, you can see an example. It's not a mistake. Uh, on the second level, we have the same feature and the same number. Uh, and on the next level, you would have four nodes that are the same. This type of trees, uh, it is more simple pred predictors that makes the algorithm less prone to overfitting, and it also uh, helps the algorithm to be uh, more reliable to parameter changes and. One more thing that you have is uh, with these trees, you can build a very, very fast predictor. Uh, the next thing is the way uh, the data that we are working with. Uh, there is uh, several types of data. There is numerical data, and it's really clear how you work with numerical data, in with, in with decision trees, with numerical data. You just put the split with numerical data, like uh, height is more than 170 centimeters. And if it is yes, then you go, go one way, no, and if no, another way. It's very simple to work with numerical data, but there is also other types of data. That is called categorical data. Uh, a categorical feature is a feature that is having a discrete set of values that are not necessarily comparable with each other by less or by less or greater. And these features can, uh, they, these features uh, can have a little amount of values, like occupation, for example. They can also have a large amount of values, for example, if it is user ID. And it is not clear how to work with this type of data. Car uh, the existing libraries either do not work with categorical features at all, like XGBoost, or work with them in a not optimal way, like, like GBM. So what you currently are doing if you are using other libraries, you are doing some preprocessing on your data. For example, you do one quote quoting, you have your numerical data set, and you give it to the algorithm. So we... Actually, cat boost is uh, from categorical boosting is because we work with categorical features. Uh, we do the whole set of things with categorical features to make it work good. The first and the most important thing in terms of quality is the statistics based on category and category plus plus label value. So let's say we have a categorical feature. What we are doing, we are calculating numerical features based on these categorical features. So the first, the first numerical feature that we will be calculating is statistics on, on, based on just category. Uh, and that is actually just the number of appearances of category and the data set. You have the data set here, uh, an example data set. Uh, you have here four objects with, uh, you, you have a categorical feature uh, occupation, four objects with uh, value SDE. So uh, the new numerical feature values, value for these three objects will be four, because there are four appearances of, the, of this feature. We, uh, so it's, it's just the frequency of the object. Um, that is the first thing. Uh, we do some normalization there, but the sense is, is this one. Uh, it would not work alone. Uh, the next thing that we are doing is we are calculating statistics based not only on category value, but also on label value. So the simplest thing you could imagine is let's calculate our new numerical feature as an average label value among all objects that have the same category. For binary classification, it will be an estimation of probability of having success given that you have this category value. For, for example, on this data set, you have three SDEs. The average label value will be three divided by, by four, so three times one and four appearances. And your new feature value will be three divided by four. Uh, but it doesn't work, so we don't do that. Why it doesn't work? Because it leads to overfitting. A simple example of that would be, let's say you have a single object with this category value. Uh, then uh, you have uh, your new uh, numerical feature value that is equal to the label of this object. And 
you, when you will be applying the model, you will not have this magical feature that is equal to the label value, so it will not work. Uh, one way to overcome this problem is the following. You divide your data set into two parts, and on the first part, you calculate the statistics, this averages, and on the second part, you train. This works, this doesn't lead to overfitting, but the problem here is that now you use only a half of your data set for training, and that is bad. I want, we want to use the whole data set. So what we are doing, we are doing the following. For each object, we calculate those averages differently. For, for the object number i, we use the objects that are before and given one to calculate these averages. So you never use the label of these objects when you are calculating statistic on, on this object. So for this object, it will be, um, you have three objects before given one in the data set that have the same category value. So your new uh, numerical feature value will be two divided by three. So actually, you, what you need to do, uh, that there might be a problem that you have some order in your data set. For example, you have all the zeros first and then all the ones. Um, so you need to do a random permutation to not have this problem. Uh, you also need to have some priors. So let's say this, this object is the first one in the data set, then you have zero by zero for this object. So we use some priors here. And uh, for different features, you need to select different priors uh, to make better quality. So inside the algorithm, we enumerate three different priors. So that is basically the thing that we are doing with categorical features. There, uh, you, you can say, we can do it during preprocessing phase. Uh, just during preprocessing, I do random permutation, calculate those statistics, and those are my new fe feature values. Uh, that, would, well, that is true, but if you are writing your own gradient boosting library, you can do better. First thing that you can do, you can use several permutations. You cannot use several permutations directly. If you uh, permute your data set, calculate one feature, then permute it one more time, calculate one more feature, and then put them together as your input data set. That will lead to overfitting in the same way that you have uh, when you are averaging through, the through your whole data set. So it doesn't work, but we want to have, uh, we want to use several permutations. So what we do is we are training several modules simultaneously. So how gradient boosting works, you build one tree, then you build next tree and so on. When you are building each tree, you first build the tree structure and then you are calculating leaf values. So. Now, we will, when we will be uh, calculating the tree structure, we will be using several permutations. Uh, so we actually use four permutations. On each iteration, we first drop a coin, then we uh, select, uh, using this coin, we select one of, four per, of our four permutations. Using this permutation, we select the tree structure. Then we are saying this tree structure, all, all our four models on, with four permutations, all of them will have this tree structure and for each model we separately uh, calculate leaf, uh, leaf values. That is basically the way that we are able to do several permutations and it gives improvement in quality. The next thing that you can do is you can use uh, categorical feature combinations. Let's say you have two categorical features, uh, color and animal. Then your new categorical feature that is combination of two of them will be blue cat, blue dog. Uh, red cat, red dog. So in, in many cases, these combinations are meaningful. But the, you can also use a combination of three, of three categorical features or of four categorical features. But the problem here is that when you're, the number of categorical feature in your data set grows, the number of possible combinations grows exponentially. So you, you not only cannot do it uh, during preprocessing, you just cannot enumerate through all the possible combinations. So what we are doing, we are, uh, we are uh, selecting the combinations in some greedy fashion. So we only look on some good combinations. The way we are doing that is the following. We, uh, when we are selecting tree structure, first we need to select the first node. Here we are only trying single categorical features. Then when we are selecting the second node, we are trying uh, the, categorical com the combinations of, of categorical features which include the first one, and uh, we, we're trying to add all possible categorical features to the first one, and so on. So we do it in a greedy fashion. This way you are able to, to have uh, categorical feature combinations. And well, the next thing that we are doing is uh, one-hot encoding also. We do it inside the algorithm. One-hot encoding works well if you have little amount of different categories. For example, for 
no, I don't know, for example, for gender, you will have little amount of categories. And in this case, it's good to use one hot encoding. What I want you to uh, not do, please do not do one hot encoding as preprocessing if you are using the algorithm because the training will be, will be longer. The algorithm will think that those are different features and for each of them it will calculate the statistics and when algorithm knows it's, it's one feature, then it can do it in very fast. So it is better to not do one hot encoding by, with your hands, let the algorithm do it for you. That is the big uh, stuff about cat uh, categorical features. And the next thing, the next thing is uh, the difference in the algorithm that we are using. So basically, uh, there is uh, classical boosting where you have, uh, when you are calculating leaf values, you are averaging, uh, your new leaf value is the average of all the gradients in this leaf. Or in Newton's step, never mind. But uh, all these algorithms, they are prone to overfitting. The reason for that is that this average gradient is, is the estimate for the gradient for all possible objects that are in the leaf. And this estimate is biased because you are making the estimate for the objects using the same model that, the model that was built using the same objects. It is easier to see uh, if you look on the error. If you estimate the error in the leaf and you are using the same model, the error will be less. Uh, so the gradient estimates are also biased and that is the reason for overfitting. So we want to not overfit. How we are doing this? Uh, it, is, it is hard to draw on the slide, so I'll try to tell you more with the words. What we are doing is uh, we do the gradient estimate for each object separately. So for each object, uh, remember we have these permutations. So for each object, we will be using, for, for the gradient estimate, we will be using a model that is trained based only on the object before given one in the permutation. So for each object, we will be training a separate model. Uh, and uh, th this way, when you are estimating the gradient for this object, you have never looked on the label of this object, the estimate is unbiased. Uh, the problem here is that this leads to an algorithm that uh, is quadratic per iteration, so per iteration, it in the end has quadratic memory and quadratic time, and you cannot really do that, so we do s we have some relaxation of this schema. Instead of training n different models, we train a logarithm of n models. Uh, the first model is based on the first object, the second on first two objects, the next on first four objects, eight, and so on. So there is, in the end, there is logarithm amount of, of uh, different models. Uh, you, can, you can multiply this by number of permutations that we have, so we train many different models simultaneously. This technique, uh, th this type of boosting, it really helps to overcome overfitting for the data sets where, you, where this problem stands very much. Uh, and that is for smaller data sets. So for data sets where you have less than 100,000 of samples, or something like that, you, uh, this thing helps a lot to improve quality. But th this uh, schema is computationally expensive. So uh, now, uh, th th those were two main uh, things uh, in quality that we have. Now let me give you some benchmarks. There, there are three things I want to talk to you about. That is the tr uh, speed of CPU training, speed of GPU training, and speed of prediction. The first one is uh, speed of CPU training. When we have put the algorithm in open source in July, we were really slow, but we are constantly working on the algorithm on speed ups. So we have uh, made a speed up um, for several times. So it's, it's now really good. Uh, on large data sets, it will be around, uh, for large data set, it will be around four times faster than XGBoost. Yes, four times faster than XGBoost. And uh, more or less the same the flight G with light GBM. For smaller data set, it will be uh, more or less the same that XGBoost. And it will be uh, about two times slower than light GBM. There also might be, uh, the, the, so we do not yet support sparse data. So if you have a sparse data set, then uh, your training will be slower. But again, we are constantly working on improving the library, so it will be faster. Now it's already faster than XGBoost. Okay, the next uh, thing is our GPU, uh, our GPU training. Uh, what I want to tell you about GPU, the main thing, it's super easy to use. You just pip install catboost and you already have your GPU. There is a feed function, and there is a parameter task type. You say task type is equal to GPU, and you have your GPU training. Catboost is the only library that gives you speed ups on older GPUs, uh, like on K40 or K80. So if, 
for example, in Google Collaboratory, there is a free, free uh, way to use GPU, and you, in, with Cat Boost, you will have your speed up. Uh, now about the comparison. So uh, Cat, Cat Boost GPU is, GPU training is about 20 times faster than XGBoost and is about three times faster than LightGBM. So we have a very, very efficient GPU implementation. Uh, so he, here are the benchmarks. I hope you have enough time to look on that. Um, yeah, so let, let's go to, to the point where you need to understand when do you want to use uh, G, GPU training. So uh, the more data you have, the more speed up you get with GPUs. Uh, here you, you can see there is a data set. Uh, here is the sample count. Uh, when, and here we are increasing the sample count in the data set. Uh, here's the baseline one, the black line, and uh, different GPUs. So with K40, when <coughs> you are increasing the number of samples, you get up to four times speed up. And with newer GPUs, you get, get up to 40 times speed up. So you really have large speed ups with GPUs. Uh, actually, CatBoost supports also several GPUs, if, if you do have them. Uh, so distribu distribute the training between several GPUs, and it will be uh, even faster. And it is also the first library to, to support multi-server GPU training, uh, distributed multi-server GPU training. Okay, uh, that is about uh, GPU, now about prediction. As I told you, uh, CatBoost has uh, these symmetric trees, which you can be implemented very efficient for, uh, the, the applier can be implemented very efficient. So the applier of CatBoost is 30 uh, to 60 times faster than other libraries, and that is because we really need in Yandex, uh, we, we really need fast applier because we have all, all these things like ads and search. So if, if you have a time critical application, you, you can try this. Okay, the next thing is I wanted to talk to you about is the ways to explore your model. So you let, we already can train the model, we know the benchmarks about the model. Now. Uh, let's discuss what are the things that we have inside the, li the library to understand what, what you have, what is in your model. The first thing is very simple, it's called feature importance, and uh, that is the nature of things to, to, um, to want to understand, and for each feature you have your feature importance, it's a very cheap operation, you have it, uh, so you like, you train your model in Python and then you just get the field where you have this, these values are already written. So it's, uh, free, it's free in terms of time. And the next thing is feature interaction. It's, uh, this thing uh, is a, a bit more computationally expensive. And that, is, that tells you uh, about the pairs of features, <coughs> which pairs of features are interacting the most. The next thing uh, is called per object feature importance, and this one is more computationally expensive. And that, uh, this one is if I want to understand for my given object, for this object, which features are the most important. And here we implemented the sharp values, and uh, you, can, you can plot a lot of stuff using sharp library. Uh, the, that's the, the guys have written, thank you to them very much. I think they had also a talk on PyData at some point. So uh, what you can see here is uh, you, you have your, uh, the value of the formula on your object and you, uh, this, the, the value of your formula is sum of importances of different features. You have some base value and, then, uh, and that is your prior knowledge on what would be the formula value if you don't know anything about your feature values. And here it's 22.53. I don't think you can see that, but I can see that. And then uh, when you are when you are uh, understanding the values of your features, then you step uh, to the right or to the left uh, to some amount. So, for example, you see that uh, your this this uh, red thing L star is equal to 498, and because of this value, you make a large step right a large step to the right, and then you make a large step to the left because of this feature value. So you can really understand something about how, how features are influence, influencing these objects. Here, the, it is another plot of the same thing, and uh, that is to understand uh, how your feature uh, are influencing uh, the objects in the whole data set. You actually can uh, calculate feature importances from that, it's like the, fir our, the first thing that I told you about, but this thing has more theoretical guarantees and you, you also have more knowledge uh, from these plots than from just the number, how important is this particular object. So for example, 
here you can see that LSTAT, the first feature, the very large values of LSTAT are giving a very, uh, very large negative impact on the objects. And the low LSTAT values are giving the high positive impact. So you can look on these plots. It is, uh, you can look on that for numerical features. You can also look on that for categorical features. As you can see, the, the dots here are blue and, and red, which means that the order on them doesn't really matter because those are hashes, because it's categorical features. But you can see what is the way they influence your objects. For, he, for example, here, the manager ID uh, from one of the data sets, uh, it has a very large negative impact for, for, for many features, for many objects, and for other, it has small positive impact. So you can get a lot of insight when you are drawing these things. The next thing that we have is called influential documents. So we, for this particular, uh, per this particular uh, object, we already know which features are the most important. Now I want to know which objects from the data set are the most important, and you can also do that. And the next thing is called uh, feature evaluation. So when, if you are having a production process, then you have some features and you want to understand for new features, are they useful or not? What you can do, you can train your model and see is there improvement or not? But uh, this, ca this, this can be random. So the result that you get can be random. And this feature evaluation uh, is uh, the thing that you put, you put, put some features inside, uh, you train this thing, and then in, uh, as an answer you get the, the amount of improvement that you have, and if it is statistically signi significant, together with the p-value. If you have a production process and you have a whole team of engineers which are uh, engineering those features, you really need that. So this, this thing can tell you very well if your new feature is, uh, is uh, good or not. So now uh, several things. First of all, uh, now I want to tell you about uh, several features of the library that you can just, that are useful. First one is overfitting detector. So remember that gradient boosting is an iterative algorithm. And not on each iteration, uh, the, number, the training error reduces. But at some point, the generalization error stops reducing. And uh, the error on your validation set st starts growing. To find this moment, you need to use overfitting detector. The next thing is a metric evaluation during training. So basically, what you can do, you can calculate uh, some metric values during your training process not only the metric that you are optimizing, but also other metrics. And you can, you can look on their values, like the values, because they are, they are uh, written to the file. You can also use visualization. We have several things, uh, s several ways to visualize different errors. Uh, so here on this plot, it's Jupyter Notebook, you, and you can plot here log loss and accuracy, or AUC, or we have a lot of metrics there. Uh, it is in Jupyter Notebook. You can zoom in, zoom out, all the stuff. It is also implemented as a separate tool uh, if you are using R or command line, and uh, we also have supported TensorBoard. TensorBoard does not have all the functionality that CatBoost Viewer has, because in CatBoost Viewer, for example, we are not, are not only plotting these errors, we, can, we are also writing how much time uh, is the training, was the training, how much time is left before the end, which is very useful, uh, and we can do that because we have Similar, uh, si similar structure of the trees on each iteration, so we can estimate that. Uh, you, you see the best, uh, your best point on the test, uh, on the validation data set, all this stuff. You can also use CatBoost Viewer to compare different models uh, in Python, in Jupyter Notebook, or in CatBoost Viewer. So that is about metrics. Now, we do have uh, missing, fe missing features, missing values support. It's a natural thing when you have uh, like you, you want to predict uh, uh, if you want uh, this per if this person will pay back the credit and you don't know his salary oh, okay you probably know his salary you don't know some some missing some missing feature and uh, to to do that for categorical features the missing feature is a separate uh, is a separate feature value and for numerical feature the missing feature. Uh, is either uh, a value that is either greater than all the values in the in the train, or uh, less than all the values in the train, and we guarantee that when we are using this split selection procedure, when we are selecting the best uh, tree structure, we guarantee that we are, uh, will be considering the split between uh, non values and everything else. The next thing is cross validation. We also have nice visualization for cross validation. 
uh, what you need to know about cross-validation is that you can also use overfitting detector for cross-validation. And we also have uh, regular cross-validation and stratified cross-validation, which can be useful if you have an imbalanced data set. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, you, there, there are several modes here. You can use stand, uh, look on standard deviation or you can lo look on the graphs for each fold. Uh, so the next thing is stage predict and metric evaluation on dataset. Basically, uh, there is a standard stage predict functionality where you want to know the values of the formula on each object, on each iteration. Uh, so you, you can use stage predict for that, but, but actually we have uh, many metrics implemented already. When you are using stage predict, usually what you want to do, you want to calculate some metric value on these on, on this, uh, on this, uh, objects. If you want to do that, you can use a separate functionality that is called evaluation on dataset. So uh, now uh, what I wanted to talk to you is uh, the parameters of the algorithm. Uh, and those are parameters that are important for quality. The first one, and this one you need to tune always for all gradient boosting libraries, and that is the amount of iterations. If you are, or you, if you are training gradient boosting, then as I told you, uh, validation error reduces and then starts growing. You need to find this moment. Uh, the important thing is you don't need, you, you need to, to wait for this moment uh, because it, it you, very often happens that people s s stop too, too early. So you, you need to wait until convergence. So that is the first thing. The second thing is learning rate. And the rule is the following for all gradient boosting libraries. The less is the learning rate, the better is the quality but the more iterations you need for convergence. <coughs> at some point, you are decreasing your learning rate. At some point, the process converges and the quality stops improving, but you need to find this moment. And the next parameter is depth. And uh, we have a value six by default, uh, which is really good, but for some data sets, you need deeper trees. So what I would suggest you to do, I would suggest you to, to try the value, default value six, try value 10, for example, and see if it improves quality, then use deeper trees. You don't really need to experiment with uh, uh, depth three, depth four, usually six is better. So the next thing is L2 regularization. It's a very standard parameter. And with L2 regularization, uh, if you see that something happens, you're, you are overfitting too fast, you can increase the value of L2 regularization, and this might improve your quality. Uh, now, next thing is called begging temperature. What gradient boosting libraries usually do, uh, when they are selecting the tree structure, they are sampling some objects, they, they use begging, they sampling some objects from, from the train, and based on those objects, they select the tree structure. What we are doing, we have this sampling also, you can, uh, you can turn it on by default, but uh, you can turn it uh, on by parameter, but by default we have, uh, we, we are weighting this object. So we are assigning weights to them. And we are sampling the weights from exponential distribution, and there is a parameter called begging temperature that controls how, my, how intensive is this sampling. If it is by default uh, equal to one, and that means we are sampling from exponential distribution, if you set it to zero, then all the weights will be equal to one, so there is no begging at all, and you can change it. And this, this parameter also can, affect, uh, can have effect, uh, effect is positive on quality. And the next parameter is called random strength. And this parameter, uh, so when we are selecting the splits, when you are selecting a split, what you need to do you need to score each feature. So, so each feature gets a score and then the feature with maximum score will be put into the decision tree, into the split. What we are doing, we are adding some randomness here. So for each, to each score, we drop a coin and add some randomness to this score. And then we are selecting the features among the, among the resulting scores. There is a lot of randomness in the start. There is a little of randomness in the end. No, but uh, the amount of randomness you can also control using random strength, it's a multiplier with this random noise that you are adding. Uh, this random noise also helps to deal with overfitting. Now, we have, uh, we have two papers that you can read. Uh, uh, one is on NIPS, uh, uh, 20, uh, NIPS 17 in Machine Learning Systems Workshop, and this one explains 
Uh, th this one is very, very technical. Uh, we ex uh, it explains how we deal with categorical features. Uh, it explains how we are training on GPU, why, we have, why our GPU implementation is faster than others. And in short words, it's because we are not using Atomics and all, all other libraries do. Uh, it also explains how we, are uh, how we are scoring, how we are calculate model value. Um, and it also has uh, the thing about the ordered boosting, so it's, it's also explained. And the second paper is more theoretical, and it has uh, the theoretical explanation of why these estimates, these gradient estimates are biased, and uh, why this schema helps to make them unbiased. So those are two papers uh, you, can, you can read. And now uh, I'm ready for questions. Rational. What's the reason? Ah, the reason. So uh, I'm not sure what was the initial reason. Actually, we, we started using symmetrical trees in 2009, I think. Uh, I'm not sure what, what, what was the initial reason, but uh, it somehow helps with be, being robust to parameter changes, and I cannot, uh, I cannot explain that, but it really helps. And it is also important for uh, model prediction. You, you, well, because we have, we have time critical applications, we, we really need a fast predictor, and it really helps in that. So th this one I can explain, the first one is harder to explain. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. We also have synonyms for our parameters so that uh, if you are using XGBoost, that it's easier for you to try CatBoost. We have the same the synonyms for parameter names. Okay. So with regards to nesting data, uh, most often in the way the criterion is implemented, uh, it's going to have a bias with missingness because with less data you have more variance and you will tend to split more on, on variables where there is a lot of missing data. Did you look at this and fix it or not? We did not look on this actually. It's an open research question. So. That's, a, that's a good question. We didn't, didn't look on this. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I am wearing a Cat Boost t shirt. <laughs> so, <laughs> please. Uh, I, I'm I'm here for for the rest of the of the days. You can ask me. I'm here. It's I'm only today in the, with a t-shirt, <laughs> but the next day you can. Yeah.